Hi, everybody. Hi, right, a bit loud there. Sorry about that. Um, thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, my name is Brian Smith. I am the head of the Diversity, Diversity Inclusion Working Group uh, for the ICME London and Southeast Group. Uh, I'm going to be the moderator tonight, so I'm going to help facilitate the, the conversation. Um, hopefully, I won't talk too much and I'll let them do the talking for me. Uh, before we dive, divide, dive into the events tonight, uh, fire exits are in the back, or so out the door to the left and then to the right again. You'll see the signs. Uh, if you need to go to the bathroom or a comfort break, um, it's back on the way we came in, just on the right. I want to start with a few thank yous as well. So firstly, thank you to, you, to the panelists for coming today. Um, we literally couldn't have a panel discussion without you here, so thank you for, for deciding to come and talk to us. Uh, thanks again to the Royal School of Mines for hosting us, um, and Pablo for sorting it all out, including the food. Um, there's some drinks now, and there's also going to be some drinks and food at the end, so I'll just remind you at the end of that. Uh, and finally, a special thank you to the team who put this all together. So Scylla, Chloe, Laura, uh, and Adam, thank you. You helped organize this whole event and promote it. Uh, so thank you very much for all your work. The Diversity and Inclusion Working Group puts a lot of these events on throughout the year. Um, if you have a topic you're passionate about or something you would like to get, um, get an event for, um, please come join us. We are a volunteer group and we are more than happy to have um, people come and join us and help organize events. Uh, so please get in touch with me. There's contact information on the flyers as well. Uh, so yeah, we'd, be lo we'd love to have you. So on to the topic of tonight. This is actually our first uh, event that the Diversity and Inclusion Working Group is hosting on disability. Um, so we've intentionally left the focus a bit broad to encompass a little bit of everything. Um, however, I'm confident the discussions are, we're going to have tonight are going to be really uh, give you a good insight of how disability affects uh, not only um, personnel, but you know the engineering community as a whole. Uh, our main objectives tonight are to kind of build awareness, challenge assumptions, uh, the empower professionals with and without disabilities uh, and discuss and share the best practice that we can use. Uh, to help us re reach those objectives today, we have four panelists who have uh, graciously offered their insight. On my left, we have Lynn Wilsey, who is the Community and STEM Ambassador for the UK and Ireland at Air Products. Uh, she joined the company in 2000 and has worked in a number of roles with the, within the organization since then. Her current role as the Community and STEM Ambassador includes working closely with the community and focusing on STEM-related activities such as the Liquid Nitrogen Demonstration Program, as well as STEM initiatives such as the Hepatia, is that correct? <laughs> project, which is a European project uh, challenging us all to adopt gender-inclusive practices in STEM education. Lynn is also a member of the Air Products ABCD Group, or Anybody Concerned About Disability Group. In 2000, she, 2008, she was diagnosed with progressive degenerative lung disease called bronchiotactis and pseudonoma, uh, which is a form of MRSA in the lungs. Uh, Air Products has supported her through this progression of her disease and is here tonight to share those experiences and show that people with disability and long-term health conditions can progress within an organization and be successful. Uh, Catherine Cobb works as a technician for Amy in its infrastructure, highways, airports, and technology division. She has obtained an ONC, an HNC, and a degree in mechanical engineering. She's also currently studying for an HND in civil engineering. When Catherine was seven years old, she developed osteosarcoma, uh, basically a bone tumor in her left thigh bone, and was forced to have her left leg amputated at the hip joint, which also took half her pelvis in what is known as a hemipervil amputation. Even at a young age, she had a passion for engineering and followed it into a number of roles, including some that were, in her words, not quite disability friendly. <laughs> On my right, we have Joe Harry, who is a um, inclusion and diversity specialist at G GSK for 18 years. 10 of those years as an occupational health professional and eight years as a human resources and IND manager. After registered nurse training, Joe completed a BSc in occupational health, 
a diploma in health visiting, a diploma in management studies, and postgraduate diploma in HR management. Everybody on this panel seems to have a lot of degree. <laughs> After a stint in the public se sector, Jo found her niche in the pharmaceutical industry and her most satisfying area of work, diversity, well-being, and inclusion in the workplace. And finally, on my right, we have Colin Fowler. Fowler. As an access to work manager for Generate, Generate Callum Fowler is a passionate champion of empowering disabled people in the workplace through supportive and corrective facilitation. With over 25 years experience in the employment ser service sector for disabled people, Colin believes in the importance of the transparent equal opportunity to employment for all disabled people across the labor market. Colin has also volunteered in a variety of situations championing equality and the dismantling of barriers facing disabled people. Into, until 2013, he acted as a trustee for the Disabled Disability Resource Center in Dunstable and as a chair for the London Disability Arts Forum. Colin combines his passion for equality and offshore sailing as the chair of the Visually Impaired Sailing Association, as well as being an active member of the Govia Thames Link uh, Disabled Access Panel. Again, thank you all for being here. We're really looking forward to this discussion. So we've kind of broken our conversation tonight into two halves. Our first half is focused on the topic of building awareness and challenging assumptions. Uh, to kick us off, uh, the UK government in 2012 stated that 5.7 million men and women of working age currently have a disability of some form in the UK. Uh, according to the statistic, Basically, this works roughly translates to 13 to 14 percent of the current workforce having some form of disability. Uh, Joe, my first question comes to you. <laughs> Do you see this? Is this a trend you see in engineering? And is there a prevalence of any certain disabilities in engineering? So, how close before it gets distorted? Is that all right? Um, so. I work for a company that has engineering within it as well in the pharmaceutical sector and the interesting thing about how much we see disability amongst our workforce is that our workforce doesn't currently monitor this. Um, it is very difficult to know who is disabled in your workforce and who isn't. I heard, overheard discussion earlier with the coffee about visible and um, hidden disabilities. Um, and we ask people to, uh, I don't like the words declare and disclose, but uh, we know that there's been research about that, to say whether they have a disability or not. And actually people um, don't exercise their prerogative and don't let us know necessarily unless they want to come out in their small local teams because of an adjustment that they require. So what's the question about you know, how much we're seeing in terms of disability and engineering? Um, many workforces may not know who they've got that's disabled and what you need instead, if I can just say this, is a such the right culture, a disability confident culture that exists within your organisation and in the local teams that you've got that people will be happy to be able to say, do you know what, I need an adjustment uh, or you know, not necessarily to say what the situation is, but the, that they need something that helps them be more productive in the workplace. So I don't think necessarily organisations are have the right culture in order for people to be able to feel free to discuss their disabilities if they are hidden or not obvious to them. Um, where it's it's uh, obvious, I think there is probably, hopefully, less serious workplace engineering injuries. Um, uh, that are reportable on RIDOR or anything than they used to be years ago. Um, there should be controls in place to stop this, but we do have occupational health nurses still who do do assessments of, um, of uh, hearing and risk assessments just to check that the workplace is safe and to check that controls are in place, that you don't get any accidents or injuries because you know, the, the lost time and the, the morbidity from people themselves is, um, is very serious as a result. How's that for starters, Brian? That's great. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, so yeah, my next question is going to more, more of um, the personal experience from that. So uh, Lynn and Catherine, can you describe some of the everyday challenges that you experienced during your work life? Uh, some of which most people wouldn't even think about when, when we go to work. So I'll pass it over to you. So Lynn, I'll start with you. Yep. Um, some of my challenges, um, mainly because 
I have an invi invisible illness, um, is that my regime takes about three and a half hours a day. Um, so I have to nebulize in the morning, nebulize in the evening, um, do physio exercises, and then clean all my equipment. So the extension of my day, I have to add three hours on without going out or doing anything else. So um, travel is, is a, a concern for me sometimes. So if I'm getting up early to get a train or get a plane, because I still travel about with my job, um, the extension of time is, is, is a problem. The weather is a problem. Um, too hot, too cold, especially too hot. Um, it really does affect my breathing and my quality of life at that point. So, you know, I, I do moan about the weather sometimes. As for me, um, I think it's a case of I've got the disability you can see, but I, I don't, when I'm, a, when I'm at work, people don't see it. That's a disability. People think, oh, I'll make myself a cup of tea, and they, uh, they expect me to carry my own cup of tea because they don't see that I'm disabled because I carry it off so well. And it, that in itself is a disability. Um, everyday challenges could be such things as they've given me a brand new laptop. Woohoo! Wonderful! It's far too heavy for me. I put it on my back in the knapsack and then I walk upstairs on my crutches and I'm top heavy and I fall over and slide down the stairs. <laughs> Silly little things, but it all adds up. Um, again, we were talking earlier, um, I have to wear PPE for my job in civil engineering, so I go out on site quite a lot and I have to look for hidden dangers wherever I go. But just putting the PPE on can be a danger for me because they don't provide a chair in the disabled toilet for me to sit down on. So it's little things that have to be highlighted. But a lot of the time it's because, yes, I look disabled because I've only got one leg, but I do carry it off quite well and they don't see it. A lot of people don't see the disability and they just carry on as normal. That's how I found um, my working career at the, at the moment in Amy. And to go in a bit of your, um, your background, like, as you said, you have some, you had some employers that really weren't helpful. Is there oh, anything that sticks out? My very first job interview, um, I was about 18 and I went for a job interview um, for a local council. And I, I walked into the interview wearing my artificial leg. Um, and the, the guy that was doing the interview went, oh, no, 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 we couldn't possibly. I said, we couldn't possibly what? Couldn't possibly employ you. Well, why not? Well, you haven't got very nice legs. Uh, excuse me? Well, I don't want to be looking at those all day. Oh, really? Well, don't look at them all day then. Bye. And I left. <laughs> and from that point on, it was a case of, I want to be in engineering. I want to be something that no one else would like, you know, would be like um, with an amputation. Um, it wasn't quite heard of. A lot of, a lot of it wasn't heard of back then. Um, but that was one of my earliest memories, was someone saying, I don't want to look at your legs. They're not very nice. I, I did literally say, well, I'll, I'll go to the limb centre and have one made especially for you to look at. <laughs> but that's a fair few years ago. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I guess, I guess this is more of a question for all of the panel. But, you know, what you, you've kind of touched on this, but what is some of the emotional impact that these experiences have on employees and how does that, how does it affect somebody's confidence at work if you're having to deal with these, these situations? Um, I guess we'll start, I've been saying on this side, Colin, I'll start with you. If you do you have any experience with people you've worked with who, who've been able to, who've had some issues with this? <laughs> Thank you, Brian. It's it's a very in, interesting um, question and quite a dilemma for a lot of um, a lot of disabled people because they've had to work extremely hard to sometimes even get through the door to uh, to to be successful in an interview without even um, having to worry about 
whether they're going to be accepted. And I think that is, that is the key to it all. We talk about, and you know, I'm very passionate about dismantling barriers. Disabled people um, are face barriers in all of their life. And the main barrier that I, I find that people face in the workplace is an attitudinal barrier. And because of the way that um, personnel within that organization preconceive disability, that can have a really negative effect on that individual. It can be extremely debilitating, demoralizing, and it can, you know, I've, I have experience from my working life of trying to help disabled people in the workplace. And because of the nature of my job, sadly, the people that come to my organization and get referred to me have a very negative experience and they're in a very uncomfortable place in their career. And it takes a lot to be able to it takes a lot to be able to salvage a employment situation when, to you, to use a word that probably isn't isn't necessarily appropriate, but you'll understand, something has gone toxic, and and that individual, if they've um, if they've uh, done their best to get that job, and they've won it on their merits, but later on. They're, they're, being, they're being viewed and scored as a disabled person. That has a tremendous impact on that person. And those people, you know, I know from the stories I hear that those people go home after clocking off work and just say, you know, it's, it's terrible for me. I have, to, I have to do so much to get through a day but nobody is prepared to make adjustments for me or be tolerant enough to understand my disability and what adjustments need to be made to help me. Can I answer as well? I have seen, sadly, managers get it wrong early and not get it right first time and that's when we have to pick up the pieces later if you've got managers that are educated about disability and that understand the language to use around disability and don't hack off their disabled employees at an early stage then you get engagement from an employee with disabilities and sometimes the managers just get it wrong, sadly. And then there becomes a situation, as you were saying, it's very hard to salvage later. Um, and you know, the, the situation is fraught already. Um, and you get to grievance. The other thing I find is that people may want to not talk about their disability. It might be dyslexia or mental health or anything like that that's um, a hidden disability early on, because they don't want to prejudice any situation. And then when something in the role changes, they've got to write more reports, they've got to do something else, things like that, and it becomes difficult for them to do it, that's when they think they might actually just flag it up, that actually need a bit more time here, or they need some help, or some other sort of software program that would help them do this better, quicker, more productively. And that's when I've seen managers say, oh, oh yeah, now she's not performing now, she says. you know, and. That's unfortunate when you get that, I think. Um, you would want there to be a better, as you were saying, Colin, attitude earlier on. Um, and this is the difficulty, I think, that, that sometimes you see in, in a culture that's not very disability confident. Um, I think from my perspective, I wasn't employed into Air Products with that disability. So I'd been working for Air Products for about eight years. Um, very good relationship with my, with my boss, HR, everybody you know, knew me as, a, as, a, as I was, as my old self. Um, when I was diagnosed in 2008, um, I made a conscious decision that yes, I would disclose 
because um, they'd helped me go through all my treatment, the um, treatment for actually getting the diagnosis. They knew about that. Our HR team, our occupational health team knew. My manager knew, but nobody else in the business knew. And nobody else in the business knew for a lot of years, up until 2015, until I actually, whoa, until I actually, <laughs> he was surprised then, that's the look of surprise. Um, so I didn't disclose to anybody in the business, apart from my manager that I worked very closely and well with, the occupational health team who were fantastic, um, and obviously my general manager at that time knew. That, that's a challenge um, when you are, you appear completely healthy, completely well, um, when you do have to slow down a little bit or you do have to work from home. Um, so I got, I got some adjustments. I work from home, I have flexible working. Um, Air Products are a fantastic company, have supported me so much through all of, of my, my, my condition for the past few years. Um, but that, that's a real challenge when you actually are perceived by other people in the business, as you say in there, when you're not performing at your 100%, um, actually, you know, do I wish I'd have disclosed earlier to people? Probably not, because I wouldn't be where I am now with people's perception um, of how they perceive me as, as, as a person in, in the business. Um, so yeah, it, 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 was, it took me a lot of years to actually come to terms with um, sharing about my disability. Um, the main reason I did was 2015, um, I did a trek, a charity trek, while I was still well enough to do it for the British Lung Foundation. And I trekked, I, didn't, I wanted to do Snowdon, but I was told the altitude wasn't good for me. So I had to rethink, I had to keep my feet on the ground. Um, and I trekked Hadrian's Wall. And when I was sending out my Just Giving link to people in the business and, and my colleagues, I just at that point had recovered enough from the diagnosis, it took many, many years, to actually feel like I had to tell them why I was doing this. Um, and then people's attitudes did change towards me. It was, it was quite startling. Um, their perception of me changed kind of overnight, yeah. As for me, um, Amy have been amazing. Um, as you can see, I can't hide my disability. As soon as I walk in a room, people go, oh yeah, she's got strange hair. <laughs> um, but Amy have supported me throughout. Um, if I've needed any sort of help, um, whether that be a better chair for me to sit on, I only had to ask. Um, they've never really, they've never challenged me or they've never said, oh, we, you know, we can't deal with you. What can we do with you? They've never said that. They've just accepted me for who I am. And that's how Amy are. They are they're just a brilliant employer for disabled. They really are. I can't, um, can't thank them enough. They give me a confidence boost every day that I go in. Um, yes, we all have our bad days and we all have, you know, our off days with our works, but on the whole, I can't fault Amy. They've, 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 they can see my disability, they've taken it on board, they said, yes, if you need anything, you just let us know and we will cover it. Not a problem. So, that, that's been really good. Thank you, thank you. Um, kind of going back to work. Um, Lynn said, um, I guess when you hear, I guess coming at personal uh, assumptions here, but when you first hear the phrase disability, people's minds immediately jump to physical disabilities. Um, but many, many times it's not necessarily obvious somebody ha has a dis is living with a disability. You know, the conditions like chronic fatigue or chronic pain and mental health issues aren't immediately obvious. Um, and things like uh, dyslexia and autism. Uh, some people, Colin, I know some people you help would consider themselves as part of the non-neurotypical uh, spectrum, so specific learning disabilities, et cetera. Um, can, you, can you describe some of the experiences or, or challenges that they specifically face, um, people who, who consider themselves non-neurotypical? You know, do these overlap a bit with how Lynn said that, um, that some of these things that people aren't immediately aware of? Um, issues that they might be facing. Thanks, Thanks Brian. From my experience, employers, when they, when they have got a 
a, a disabled person with a very visible disability, like a physical disability, they, lap, they love it because it's so much easier for them to deal with. Um, when it comes to somebody with a hidden disability, and multiple of hidden disabilities, and we must all remember that the workforce, the workforce is aging, and therefore there are a lot of people who may not consider themselves prime candidates to be a disabled person now, but 10, 15 years on, they could have a, a multiple of long-term health conditions, which would find them in the bracket of the definition of disability. And that is very difficult for employers to, to embrace in the same way as they would embrace a physically disabled person, where it should be quite easy for them to make reasonable adjustments for. When we, when we talk about hidden disabilities, we must, we must refer to the, the big taboo, mental health. You know, one in four of us during our working life could experience a mental health condition. And that is really difficult for employers to actually factor into their working practices. And I'd just like to give you a little bit of an example. So the example here is that you've got somebody working in a small engineering company on a stamping or cutting machine and the guard, the guard is broken. Um, so there is a health and safety risk for that individual. Now that employer isn't going to allow that person, you know, a scrupulous employer isn't going to allow that person to continue using a stamping or cutting machine, flouting health and safety regulations and putting that person at risk. However, for people that could well have a, an Ill, a, a mental ill health condition, employers are very, very slow to actually understand that they have the same obligations to make adjustments and ensure that that employer, employee is kept safe under the health and safety um, stress at work directive. How many employers uh, will embrace somebody with a mental Ill health condition? Very, very few. It's 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 a classic hidden disability that they fail they feel very difficult to come to terms with. But. There is, there is help for them out there. You know, these, these matters should be referred to occupational health. You know, the HR business partners within the organization will be able to pick up on it and refer it to occupational health. And hopefully, occupational health will understand better about mental ill health disorders and be able to make recommendations that can direct the line managers to work with that individual in a manner so that individual doesn't feel that they're at risk working, continuing to work, and it, you know, can, can do their job like anybody else. Right. You're so right. We see it all the time, managers piling more and more work on somebody that's know had a, has been fragile um, or a little bit vulnerable from a mental health health perspective um, and that's just as bad as the machine without the guard um, and yet and there have been cases and there have been fines um, for employers over the years who, who 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 actually do this on the other hand we have been looking actually in my company at and a lot of companies have this now mental health first aiders you may well have heard about this they are really people who um, can identify themselves in some way in, in as many departments as you can as being somebody that somebody that's feeling a bit fragile mentally can, can actually go and speak to without prejudice um, so that they can feel able to talk 
uh, without, uh, so that there can be some sort of I don't know, conversation brokered then with their line manager, with somebody, some sort of supportive colleague as well, because I think it's it's a real taboo and it's really hard to do for people. But you know, you're on hiding to nothing if you don't sort it out um, and give people support in this way with mental health. The other thing, of course, I adore is neurodiversity. More organizations more employers should be so welcoming of neurodiversity i mean the fact that that you might be more creative because you've got a different kind of brain pathway that gives you sadly dyslexia at the same time or or you're on the autistic spectrum which i'm sure we all are we're just at all sorts of ends and whether it affects us or not differently it's about having the the courage i think in organizations to to be able to accept recruitment of candidates who may not give you eye contact fine you know there's other things that they can do they're probably more focused they can do this or that we have a lot of people again who i know about in my organization that on the autistic spectrum and as, as sort of lynn was saying their line manager may know and their small immediate team but nobody else may because we do make um, adjustments for them that probably nobody else in the company would know for example if i can just go on on autism for a bit <laughs> we have we have a young lad that <clears throat> he mustn't sit near the window because if he does he will count the numbers on the tops of the buses and it's little things like that which are which you know i just i just think he knows what that he actually he has a he has to do various um, I suppose ritualistic things like that if he's allowed to uh, and so to focus on the job also he doesn't like to have people coming up behind him so although we smart desk and anyone can work anywhere he tends to sit in the same desk because it's got the wall behind him so he can see everybody he also hates the manager being not on time to meetings and he once told the manager in no uncertain tones that uh, that he would appreciate more punctuality from his line manager it's little things like this you know he wants to be able to wear shocks headphones that give him some white noise because you know do I, and also we have we have this wonderful a bit like Chelsea and Westminster the glass atrium um, and the noise echoes round like a swimming pool and this particular gentleman absolutely hates that noise he just runs through this this area as quickly as possible which I had no idea about until he told me about it so there's lots of things we learn ourselves if only you can gain the confidence of your people with disabilities or differences or that are non neurotypical mm -hmm. Uh, so that you can actually learn and uh, take a, people are individual what will have be okay for one person won't be for somebody else but it's about having that again that that openness of culture to learn and listen from disabled employees themselves and say this is how it works for me uh, and make those adjustments thank you very much you just marked my question the next question off the list so there we are <laughs> um, We'll move on to more of the challenging of these of the assumptions that you kind of see as your everyday life so um uh, you've had to confront or see assumptions being made by your either employers employees colleagues customers etc uh, what are some of the more prevalent ones that you see when when people find out about your disability i'm sorry some of the some of the some of the assumptions that they just automatically assume about about it and then how do you how do you either correct them or just <laughs> mess with them or I don't know. <laughs> Start with I, I think for me people don't assume a lot because it's completely invisible so when I meet people for the first time they would know nothing about my condition um, I think that where I mentioned the change of when I started sort of coming out at 2015 um, people very quickly started to touch me a lot and, and sort of ask, are you okay? And, and actually give me more than I actually needed. They'd never done that before. It was, it was all quite strange. Um, and I had to kind of prove myself again um, that I'm very capable, very skilled, very you know, positive, and, and I can, can do the job. So some, not all people, but a lot of people actually did start to treat me very differently. Um, I think working for a company who has supported me through my diagnosis and we're talking about mental health, that very dark time when you're told that you've got a progressive degenerative condition and there is no cure, um, that, that helped me greatly, knowing that I had the backing of my managers and, and occupational health. And some people, when I, when I actually did come out, I'm quite glad I did, because then some people actually 
gave me a bit of a break on situations when I wasn't, you know, 100%. Um, people stopped asking me and, and rolling their eyes when I was working at home because they kind of understood a bit more why I needed to work at home. You know, bleeding from your lungs in a day. First aiders, uh, they would just get me in hospital if I was in the office. Um, so there are times when I need to be at home, but that assumption of, oh, she's off again, or, oh, she's always working at home, um, that kind of stopped and people became um, more accepting um, of that. For me, it's... <sighs> My employers would go, well, we assume you need to sit down more. Or we, we assume you uh, need um, a special seat. Or you sh them sort of assumptions. Um, and no, I don't. Not really. Um, they assumed, oh, you'd be wearing your leg at work then. No, I can't wear my leg at work, so I have to sit down for nine hours. I can't wear my false leg for nine hours. I can't wear it for two hours. It's just, you know, just far too painful. Um, but the little assumptions like that, that, that they didn't realize, oh, oh, okay, so she can't do this, or she can't do that. Oh, we'll have to work around it then. Um, but it's, it's mainly uh, when colleagues come up to me, they just assume, um, basically, that... So, so they, they panic. They go into complete panic mode. Oh, oh, you need to sit down. Let me get you a chair. No, I don't. But, but you, you stood on crutches. It must hurt. Yes, it does, but it's not a problem. I can still stand. You know, don't assume that because I use crutches or a false leg that I'm not as strong as the next person. Um, I go to the gym. I swim. I'm fitter than most able-bodied people. That's that's how that's how I see people. They 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 just assume that I'm a lot weaker than them. No, <laughs> nowhere near. I'm a lot stronger than you, um, mentally and physically at times. Um, that's the sort of assumptions I've come across. Yeah. And more on, on this side of the panel. Um, so sort of the professional side. So what do you see from employers and some of the assumptions that or that you kind of help have to help the employers through and like some of the assumptions that you guys see? I think you need um, this, uh, you need good um, sort of training e-learning programs in your company in order to get through to all your line managers who are constantly changing. Um, there's high turnover often and as soon as you've got around one whole load of line managers the next year is all completely different. It's a constant you know painting of the fourth bridge I think educating people about uh, educating the employees, the line managers, uh, about disability um, so they don't make assumptions about people. I have a lovely story in that um, uh, we had uh, an industrial placement student once who was in a wheelchair and um, she, she was posted into HR uh, to somebody else originally and then came through really to me and uh, who I sort of got on very well with her, but there were certain aspects I didn't know about her. And I said, well, maybe, you know, do you want to join the gym? Um, and so we went down to the gym and they did say to her that she wouldn't be able to join because she was in a wheelchair. Now, little did she, they know, or I know at the time, but she very correctly told us at that point that she actually is, she was in the Olympic sort of picking squad for wheelchair tennis at Roehampton on a Monday and a Thursday evening. And, uh, and in fact, her arm strength was incredibly good and incredibly important to her. And uh, of all the people, she used to hoik, undo her wheelchair and hoik it across her body into her mo motability mini. And I couldn't do that. She was incredibly strong and needed to keep up that physicality and that strength in her arms, even though her legs didn't work. And this assumption that the the gymnasium said, well, I don't think so, was uh, when you're talking about assumptions, was a really bad one there. And we learned an awful lot at that point as well. And in saying that, um, I'm sorry to say um, that 
within then another year or so later, this was a while back now, um, one of our security gentlemen did turn away a service animal, um, a, which was a guide dog for the blind, at our gate saying no dogs on site. So there are still learnings to be had. And uh, some, I will never you know, assume that all of our employees or partners or, or um, service partners who provide our security or anything else actually know their stuff um, and it's it's can be you know really embarrassing for the organization you know nobody wants sort of daily mail headlines over it and um, it's you know it still goes on that we need to uh, make sure that people are educated so assumptions aren't made shall I hand it on to Colin Go for it. assumptions Colin. <laughs> assumptions um, okay so <laughs> I think I think we we all face um, we all face incorrect assumptions in the workplace, and I definitely I definitely um, I definitely have experience of clients being referred to me that have it all of the time. You know, you've um, you've got clients that um, have an autistic or on the autistic spectrum disorder and people make all sorts of assumptions about them but i was very i was very pleased to hear your earlier example joe of the um the reasonable adjustments that you made that were made for your um, your employee at gsk just recently i had a gentleman come in to come into my office quite distraught on monday to see what assistance he could get um, and this isn't this isn't a role that I, I take up, but he was after he was after legal assistance um, because his employer um, his employer had failed or was continuing to fail to make reasonable adjustments for him. So this this guy had previously worked in an organisation where a small a small company. He'd been very fortunate. He he got the he got the job, and the CEO of the company said, "I understand all about your disability. My son has a dyslexic condition and was assessed, and we make a number of adjustments for him, and I will carry those forward and make adjustments for you in the workplace." And it was an absolute triumph for him. Sadly, for one reason or another, probably economic, the individual decided to move on. And his second experience at working for an employer wasn't as rosy, to say the least. And his line manager referred to him as the slow person in the team. And the organisation, although he, although he arrived at the organisation with his own specialist software, Dragon Pro, to um, to help him work as productively as anybody else. The organisation's IT department refused to test or approve the equipment to go live on their system. And it, you know, we were talking about. Uh, Joe mentioned the breaking down of that working relationship, and I, I talked to you about, you know, how, if possible, we can try and salvage these things. But when you've got to a situation where it's almost unsalvageable, an individual is seeking legal advice on how to, how to pursue something through an employment tribunal, it's almost as if the fire has been lit. Less and there's no way that you're going to be able to, be able to put it out. Uh, a, my role at Generate is to actually work with employers to identify where there are reasonable adjustments that should be made for people with a medical condition or a, or a disclosed disability. And that isn't always simple because sometimes you have to think outside of the box. Some reasonable adjustments aren't as obvious as 
what I would what I would call is the reliance of the dis, dis, the Department of Work and Pensions to throw kit at a solution. It is it isn't always about kit. It's about attitudinal change and being more creative with the with the ideas and the the adjustments you make. Yeah, I'll just add. Once you've lost that trust, it's very hard to get back. Uh, one thing, Colin, you mentioned earlier was was the idea that disability is more on a spectrum. So uh, th there's the idea that either it's a kind of a binary situation, either you have a disability or you, or you don't. Um, but the reality is that most, if not all of them, are, are on some sort of spectrum. Uh, sometimes they affect you, other times not. Uh, and in some cases, they manif manifest later in life. Uh, Joe, you, I mean, Lynn, not, not Joe, I'm asking you the question next. Lynn, you mentioned this earlier, that it, it hit you nine years ago. And then it, it's sort of been, been that process of dealing with that over, the, over time. Um, Joe, from a from a HR perspective, how do you deal with that? I mean, GSK has been great about supporting um, people with disabilities of all, of all kinds. How, what are what are some of the things you guys have in place to to deal with that transition, like later in life? Yes, of course. Some people, as you say, it is a spectrum, and people's um, people's experience of it individually is very different. So um, somebody may be able to um, cope with a disability. Uh, very well because they have got everything set up around them and when we talk about social model of disability and how much we're disabling the people rather than you know if they had an environment which is absolutely perfect for them they wouldn't be disabled and if you've got that right for people they don't feel disabled and they don't want to talk about the disability they just want to be you know a manager in the company just like anybody else um, and they don't want to be defined by it um, and I think that's important for us to always, you know, remember how individual it is. And of course, some people, they might have the same disability. It might be a degree of say, a hearing impairment, but they feel hugely disabled by it because they haven't got the right, you know, kit. <laughs> Not always the right thing to do, isn't it? Throw stuff at them, as Colin says, though. Or the right people around them that, um, that think for them, that, um, that make sure that there is, uh, they book a, a, a room with a round table in it rather than a long rectangular one. I've had that from people with hearing impairments. So it's much harder to lip read or to check who's speaking up and down a long rectangular table than it is from a nice round one in a meeting room. We've got plenty of meeting rooms that have got round But if your team are thinking of you from that respect, then they get it right. And you don't feel disabled as a hearing impaired person. Um, sorry, am I saying the right sort of things for the answering your no, question? <laughs> But it was something about um, how how we as employers are oh finding adjustments. That's right. Oh, there's I mean, as you say, there are loads. There are things about um, equipment. There is hardware. There is software. There is flexible working. I think Lynn mentioned that. Um, and there is um, there is team cohesion. There is understanding in the team. There is making sure that um, actually very often there's there's teams of people in the company like myself in mind that know the latest things that are available for people. Um, for example, we can now use for people that are hearing impaired a company that we ring up that listens also in to the live meeting when there's people from the U.S. on the call. Um, with different accents and from Germany and from the UK all on the same call, it's a Skype call, they will um, caption it straight away, palantype it, so that they will be able to then produce a transcript by the end of the meeting and the person can, can not only see it rolling on the screen instantly, so they're getting the information from the live meeting in real time, even when they can't lip read the people that are on the call that are speaking in a US drawl or something like that. Sorry, I don't subjective I mean say a southern state <laughs> um, but it, the person who is listening in from this you know sort of a, a switchboard in, in Waterloo somewhere will be able to transcribe all that immediately um, and 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 we get the transcript 15 minutes after the call as well so the person can refer to it later it's about knowing what's available and those kinds of things are godsends these days and it's modern technology and I'm sure as, as probably I'll pass it on to Colin will attest that um, we were talking about Braille earlier. We have very few people that need Braille now in GSK because they have jaws. 
uh, which is the, um, the Windows software, uh, which will read everything out, you know, or Siri on their iPhone or something like that. There's a lot more technology now that's available for people than there used to be that should really create that, play that level playing field that, that makes people feel that they actually aren't disabled in this environment any longer. Um, my earlier talk about my industrial placement student in the wheelchair, um, <clears throat> she showed me her flat and all the PowerPoints, oh they are like in this room, were at, were at sort of, you know, wheelchair height, you know, they weren't right down at the bottom on the floor in the skirting board. You know, everything was to hand um, for her in her flat and when she said when she's in her flat she's not disabled, but when she comes into an organisation that's not, that's not created for her, it disables her. Um, she couldn't get through our gates, she had to be let through because uh, her pass didn't allow her to get through the circular turnstile. So the, uh, so the security people had to let her through the big gate, but she had to wait for them each time to do it. And as soon as we realised that, that, she said, well, I'd like to get through the gate on my own like everybody else can. And then we allowed her pass to have the special, act to activate you know, the, the main gate because it hadn't done before. It's about not disabling people because we do that to them very often. I'll pass on, shall I? <laughs> Would you like to say? Let's see what you I think what I'd, I'd like to add, add to that, and I don't disagree with anything Joe said, is as, as line managers, we are, we are taught or we learn very quickly to engage with our personnel. And it's, it's a key to working with a disabled person. Engage with them, ask their advice. They may not know what reasonable adjustments need to be made for them. However, they will have a fairly good idea of what practices are going to disable them. And from the from the beginning that is that's key, that is so much the key to it it's as joe's joe said you know if i was to be working for an organization and they had take they'd taken the assumption that they would produce everything to me in braille although i am a braille reader i'm a very slow braille reader and nowadays technology has really really bypass Braille and, and so many people either use it just in their leisure or um, struggle because it's just not quick enough to be able to use it at work. Joe talked about um, JAWS which is um, JAW, uh, a, a screen reader designed for Windows products but there are more and more other screen readers available for blind and visually impaired people and also screen readers for people with a, a dyslexic condition and a lot of that equipment now is open source which is fantastic not only is that a great benefit to to the individual but it's also a tremendous benefit to organizations because Although there is funding for equipment through the Department of Work and Pensions under the Access to Work program, they tend to, they tend to use workplace assessors that have only ever come across one type of screen reader software. And although that is approved and tested by most major organizations, it can be quite slow in getting that funding approved for that equipment to be purchased. Whereas a piece of open source equipment could be used straight out of the box, providing the IT people are actively encouraged not to disable disabled people as well. I was going to ask this question later, but I think it I think it really plays into what we've been talking about now. And it's it's 
treading that fine line between supporting somebody and actually empowering them. So not just giving them something, but you know, finding what what they really need to do that. Um, and I guess my question to you guys is is how do you how do you, how do employers tread that? Is it something that needs to be led by the employee themselves? Or is it something that um, they would like provided earlier? Like, what are your thoughts on these? So I'll start with I'll start with Lynn, I guess, and then work this way. Yeah, I think the empowerment. I think it's a two-way thing. I think as a, a, a person getting a diagnosis, um, which is crippling um, at that point, it, it's it's about really reflecting on what you need to be a great employee. For, for a company. Um, so some of it comes from the employee, I would say, uh, but also then it's about having a management structure that are prepared to listen and prepared to act. So the laptop was interesting when you said a heavy laptop. When I got my diagnosis, one of the things was when I travel, just lifting my laptop in and out of my car or in and out of, off and on off trains, um, I was adjusted to have the lightest laptop available with the best trolley and, and all of that. So it, I think it's a two-way thing. Um, I, I was very lucky. I got lots of adjustments. Um, so flexible working, I could work at home. Um, and that was driven through occupational health. So it's having that understanding structure and HR department who are willing to work with you to keep you empowered. So you are actually still making a difference in the business and being a great employee. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, it's exactly the same with Amy. Um, they listen to whatever I need and they provide it, regardless of the cost. Um, but for me, I don't see myself as disabled. I don't say I'm disabled. Um, I've got a piece missing. That's it. And that's the empowerment. That's the upper hand on the disability regardless of what disability you've got, that's the upper hand. If you think of yourself as, oh, I'm, I'm disabled, that's it, life's over. No, it's not. No, I've got a piece missing, that's it, I'm not disabled. I will never be disabled, I'll never say, oh, I'm disabled. It's not, it's not how it is. It's the mindset, and that's the empowerment in a company, and it's how your colleagues see you. You shouldn't have your colleagues coming up to you and saying, oh, you're amazing, or you've got such a disability. You wouldn't want it, love, you know. But it's, that's the empowerment. You are, you are encouraging other people in your company, and you're encouraging employers um, to ask questions. But that, that's the empowerment. That's the, that's the be all and end all for me. <clears throat> yeah, you certainly don't want to be defined by your disability. Uh, you want to be known for the um, the wonderful you know, manager that you are in that particular department. But what we do have, and I do worry if it's not defining people more than it should do, but this was my thing on empowerment, is affinity groups, networks, employee resource groups. In our company, there's far more in the US than there are in the UK. But you almost have to put your hand up to have a disability to be want to be in it. Um, it is about, like, was it A, B, C, D? It is about, you know, a lot of people having an interest in disability to be joining a disability network. Uh, but also, um, it took a long time to get off the ground in my company. Um, I think people are hesitant about it, but actually, you know, it does empower them. The, it's the affinity, it's the rest of the, it's the whole group has quite a good voice, and more has been done because of our disability network pushing things as a more powerful voice um, uh, than, than if when people were trying to do it on their own. So that was um, empowering, I feel, to have that network. Oh, Colin, yes. My, my perspective on this, and I said to Joe, we'll probably clash over this, <laughs> but um, I, don't think, I don't think we will clash, really. Our disability, is, or our, our impairment and our diagnosis is something unique to us. We own it, so therefore give us the opportunity to empower ourselves, or you should at least enable us to decide what is best for us. 
And to use a, a disability movement mantra, nothing about us without us. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, Joe, well, you mentioned the ABCD network. Um, can you tell me, can you, how, Lynn, can you tell me how that's kind of set up and how, how it works at Air Products? Because that is, uh, I think it's a good way to empower people. Yeah, so the ABCD is anybody who's concerned about disability. Um, I've been a member for quite a few years now. Um, people who are members don't have to have the disabilities or be registered disabled in any way. Um, it's just people who come together who are concerned about that and want to actually get a network of people um, looking at support. So one of the reasons we found this event was because Chloe did a bit of a shout out into the ABCD community. Um, we are an American company, so from a, you're saying there's a lot more in, in the US and, and um, you know, it's, it's quite prevalent there. So we are an American, and it's a global um, network. It's not purely UK and Ireland. So yeah, we share articles and we, you know, look at things that, you know, are, are of interest to people um, regarding either whether it's human rights or whether it's um, just interesting pieces of information to share with each other. Um, some of the people who are members of that, um, I, I was quite surprised by some of them um, as well, which was, was, was interesting. You know, they say, oh, you're, you're a member of that. And, oh, well, you're a member of that. So it actually brings us closer together um, as employees as well and, uh, and as a community. Um, but yeah, I, I, I enjoy being part of, of that group and, uh, and supporting it. And yeah, since 2005, I've been a lot more vocal in that. Thank you, thank you. I'm just conscious of time now, so um, I'm skipping around a bit. Um, my next question, I guess, is is kind of how you how you deal with resistance in the company. So we've we've talked about this or, uh, briefly and, and mentioned a thing, but a lot of times you need a big culture change in a company to actually get people on board. Uh, Joe, you mentioned it's it's getting buy-in, it's getting senior managers and line managers involved. Uh, I guess, I guess my question to everybody at the table is um, how, how do you affect that change and are there like certain positions that should be written? Is there, is there procedures, training, personnel roles or something that should be adopted uh, within a company structure to make um, disability um, something that is highlighted and something that it makes sure everybody is able and empowered at work? Do you, do you have any, any ways and any, any ideas in terms of how to incorporate those ideas? So we'll start. Let's start with Colin on this side. As a disabled person, I think one of, one of the key ways to, um, to change a culture within an organization is to, to have disability seen from the top leadership of that organization. So employing disabled people at um, with meaningful roles in strategic positions within the organization re really helps. Another, another way is to actually challenge the ignorance because there is a lot of, well, I never knew um, amongst live managers and, he, and that is, you know, that's, that's not wrong. But um, you can understand why, you know, disability is so um, so multifaceted. Not all line managers or people within an organisation can be expected to understand every aspect of of disability. And especially, we spoke earlier about the difference between physical or and um, and hidden disabilities. It's very prevalent there, and. If you can if you can educate people to show them that having somebody with a disability isn't necessarily going to cost isn't going to affect the bottom line of that organisation, there are ways of factoring in assistance. And it, Joe mentioned about how much of a positive experience it can be having a very inclusive and diverse workforce. You know, when you consider that 14% of the population is or knows somebody with a disability, 
then that is that is a pretty impressive customer base to to be able to tap into and i think that is again a really important message to be able to send to the heads of organizations and um, people working within those organizations yes and oh goodness there is resistance sometimes um, and you do make me think of examples Colin you're absolutely right <clears throat> you just need to employ more people with disabilities because you've got to have those role models how many times I think people have said well, I don't see anybody with disability in this organization and and then I sometimes think actually I can probably count them on one hand a bit um, but the more you employ people with disabilities the more people are you know they get over it they're used to it it happens it works the people <clears throat> are productive they are creative it is a diverse environment that makes for a more sustainable company that's the business case um, and anyway all our customers have disabilities as well so you know let's reflect what our customer base is and things like that and there is such thing as a, the purple pound but one thing I shall say is that um, we I think we've got over a little bit of resistance in that um, we joined the Business Disability Forum. Now, of course, they exist as a sort of employer organization. Uh, you pay them a subscription and they assist you hugely with a free helpline and with training and materials and leaflets. And they also, and I've brought it with me here, um, I'll just sort of hold it up, but for purposes of the recording, then it's not going to be able to be seen. My Disability Standard Self Assessment Report which is very telling and I'm not showing it to anybody <laughs> but it, it does sh it hold a light up to yourself um, um, fortunately you can just do it as a self-assessment first before you if you're very good they publish you <laughs> um, but they won't uh, they're very confidential the business is before if, if you if, the, if you don't want it known what your score is when you do it they won't tell anybody uh, but you know yourself where you're scoring poorly and where you could make a huge difference and a huge effort and where you actually need to make changes in the organization and it might be in education and training and it might be in your recruitment and maybe you want to track maybe have some mystery shoppers maybe you want to track you know if you are asking people you know um, when they are a candidate if they have a disability are you able to track whether that actually turns into a hire at the end of the day for the company or not or how many people are not making it through and is that a worse proportion than um, for other members um, of candidates that came through so it is about um, looking at inwardly at yourself doing these uh, self-assessments and that actually really does help and it also is very good the network just and so enjoyed showing this to management um, and saying here's our voice now you know look and of course site access audits all sorts of things like that which actually show you objectively how you're doing and I suppose it's like a benchmark against other organizations uh, so you get the truth and you can make an effort in that area uh, to try and well beat that resistance Um, I, th I think for me it was interesting what Colin was saying about you know leadership team um, having people on the board or, or actually around that table um, I've been very lucky with our products um, lots of hard work and um, lots of opportunities but I do sit on the leadership team within our products for the UK and Ireland so I do sit around the table looking at strategy and and actually working with the leadership team um, knowing that I sit in that seat you know the discussions we have um, with HR and with recruitment and, and with that piece that's in my mind um, to actually you know make us a better company so you're quite right I think you know having more people with disabilities or, or disabled um, impaired people around the, the leadership uh, area um, can make a big difference to, to organizations Thank you. Um, yeah, about 15 minutes left, just, just under. Um, so I guess before we, we open up to see if you guys have any questions, um, we touched on this earlier, but uh, I kind of want to leave it on a more of a positive note. Um, and and there, there, you mentioned before, Joe, that uh, that people with disabilities actually bring a unique perspective to the company. Um, and 
we, we talked about how, how um, people with disability need, need some more help or need help to achieve their full potential. However, I want to make sure we do highlight what, what benefits they bring. So um, do you guys, I'm going to go, to go around the table, start with Lynn this time. Do you have any examples or any, anything that uh, you think people with disabilities specifically bring as a benefit to the company or, or what, what the company benefits from, from employing somebody with a disability? I think um, if I look at myself pre-2008, yes, I was a positive person, yes, I was a go-getter and I was quite ambitious and career-driven. Um, I think having the diagnosis that I had, um, resilience came in, so it actually made me a more resilient person, um, more positive, um, actually, you know, made me challenge myself a lot more about what is possible. So when I told my husband I was going to walk 26 miles and it's not a walk, it's a trek, it's uphill, I didn't know. I didn't know there was hills, I just thought it was flat. You know, doing things like that actually gives you a massive um, confidence boost in yourself that you actually bring into the workplace. Um, so for me, it, it's the resilience that people can bring and the creative thinking. So you do have to work creatively um, in some situations because I have a shorter day some days because I'm not well. Um, so I have to be creative in, in what I do and how I, how I work. I think for me, I think I encourage people every day. Um, I've been called a role model in my company. Um, I can't see it, but they do. Um, but yes, I think I encourage people to come into work every day and they look at me and think, well, if she can do it, and she's an amputee, she's got strange hair, uh, she's got arthritis in every joint, um, um, osteoarthritis in relatively all of my joints, if she can do it and have a smile on her face, then I can do it. That's what I bring to the company as a disabled person. And that's what I think, I, I just like to encourage people. And what I would like to do is to see other disabled people that are on benefits, like I was. Um, I was on benefits for 15 years when I was looking after my special needs sister and my elderly mother, um, to get back into work, get back to a career, that's what I'd like to do. That, I'd like to encourage. That, that's all I need to do, really. When I was at school, there's n there was nobody, as far as I was aware, with a disability in, in my class, in my year group, or in the whole school. I have children, and in their classes have been people with cerebral palsy and Down syndrome. And that integration, um, I felt, was so, they were so much more fortunate growing up in a class where some of the children had needs, and you had to, you know, accept that and give them a hand. And and it was they grew up thinking a lot more openly, I think, about people and their abilities and they didn't see the disability. Well, I grew up seeing the disability. Um, and I think that if you can fill your organization with as many people as possible that have that ability, but they happen to have disabilities, but we're not looking at that anymore, we can see past that, then I think you've got a more rounded organization. You've got, I don't, I don't want to say acceptance, but it's, it's about just acknowledging you know, the ability that the people have and not seeing that disability and just get get over it, you know, it's not a big deal. Employ people with disabilities. They actually have, they've done loads of research on this, there's no worse attendance or punctuality. You know, they, in fact, they've got better, I think, attendance metrics than people, you know, that, that, did, that are non-disabled. And in fact, what we have, and it's helped enormously with the culture in my organisation, we have three We've got 15 sites in the UK, three sites. There are supported internship programs. Support internships are specifically actually for young people with learning disabilities. But actually, um, some of those people with learning disabilities also have physical disabilities, and it's been absolutely great. You know, things like um, cerebral palsy and Down syndrome or some, some other issues that they've had um, along with uh, muscular dystrophy, along with their learning disability. Um, 
and it's, it's helped us understand people with disabilities more. And it's, as Colin said, the more you have of people with needs, the more you get accustomed to it, that it's not a big deal to have, make an adjustment or an accommodation. It's really not a big deal anymore. Um, you, it becomes the norm, and that's what you want it to become. And then you're just not, hopefully, seeing the disability anymore, and you're seeing the person for who they are. You're not defining them by it, and you're seeing them for their abilities, the, the clever things that they do, the creative ways that they think, and those sorts of things. Um, and I think it's about that um, integration. You get more. You get. Oh, we see it in, in our sport internship students, huge loyalty. Um, they find um, they, the, some of the tasks, they just need it broken down step by step, and then they've taught it one-to-one. -one. They can do it as well as any graduate we have in the company. They just haven't had the time and the investment. And very often, you know, they can just work on systems and processes the same as everybody else. They just need it slower, and they'll get it. And we have discretionary effort from them and engagement from them and loyalty from them, punctuality and attendance that's second to none. And the point is, the other employees now see that, and it, but it took having people in the company in order to make that point, I think. Colin? Brian, can you just repeat the question? <laughs> <laughs> so, I've, it's oh, been I, I, riveting I, listening to it. <laughs> it was just about asking, um, what, what do you think that people with disability bring as a benefit to the company rather than... Um, what we were speaking about, the need, rather than just having the needs adjusted, what do you think companies are about? What do they bring? I'm going to be biased here. <laughs> and, and I think we're, we're all, we could all be a little bit biased being, being disabled people, but you know, we bring a tremendous, um, tremendous color to an organization. We, you know, Everybody harps on now about diversity. You can't get anything more diverse than multiple impairments and disability groups. That is diversity. And if, a, if an organization wants to truly reflect the customer, its customer base, then it's got to embrace employment of disabled people. Well, thank you guys. Um, we're just about out of time, but uh, I wanted to make a point to open up to any questions from you, from you guys in the audience. Do you all have any specific questions you want to ask our panel? Go on, give me. Thanks, it's more of a comment really. Um, I really enjoyed all of the uh, discussions that we've had so far. Um, but just going on the two points that have been raised, one about the culture of an organization and the other one about um, the benefits that employing disabled people bring. Um, there's actually a lot of evidence, and I do have sources for this. I, I am biased, a bit like Brian, but, but there is um, evidence to support the fact that disabled people are on average, and of course there's always going to be individual differences, um, but on average disabled people are every bit as productive as non-disabled employees. Um, but we do have significantly less time off sick, uh, stay in our jobs a lot longer, have far fewer workplace accidents, all about that access to the purple pound, and also what's being covered, that we do learn new skills over and above the skills that we might have had anyway to overcome having to navigate our way around a world that isn't really um, designed for us. So actually, employing disabled people, you know, the whole culture thing, it isn't about oh, what a shame, poor people, we ought to give them a chance. It's about, my God, these people have got all the skills and talents we need, and as an organization, we need them. So it's kind of charity turned on its head. Disabled people are doing employers a favor by working for them and bringing all of the good things they bring. I just wanted to add that onto what had already been said. Uh, I have a question for not the whole panel, really, but anyone that feels they could answer it particularly well. Um, we've heard a lot about the advantages that disabled people bring, um, the problems they face in against with a company, or you know things that companies do well. Um, do you think the industry as a whole in engineering is doing enough to make this visible to the public eye and encourage disabled people that are in school or in university and say, we we do want you. We are you know a lot of what has been talked about sounds very internal, 
um, which is, of course, very important for the company to get it right. But I feel like it's equally important for the public to be shown. We do, you know, and particularly the disabled public, we do want you. You are valuable. Do you think the industry is doing enough? And if you don't, what would you suggest to be the main things that can be done? I'm very glad you asked that question. <laughs> I had to skip that because of time, but that we're, yeah, that's very good. Does anybody want to start particular? Go on. <laughs> um, for the purposes of the recording, I stuck my hand up and waved it. <laughs> um, recruitment is the big area. You are so right. And um, I understand. And every so often um, at my company, we have um, the university um, sort of people in and I always do a little talk on diversity and, and, and how welcoming we are and what a fantastic culture we have at our organization um, because I would wouldn't I but I, I do sometimes worry and think are we attracting them because you've got to have a website um, that people with disabilities can read and, and Colin will know how, difficulty, how difficult it is sometimes if screen readers can't read the website in an organized manner. Maybe you can tell us about how difficult it is, it is Colin, to, to look to be a disabled candidate. But you, you've, got to have, you've got to be attractive to disabled candidates. Um, and do you know what? They'll just go to the next company if, uh, if they don't go to yours. And you've got, your company's got to learn that lesson because you, you want to have a look at your statistics at candidates and see if you actually are attracting people to at least apply. Um, and and it, does it look friendly? And I, I understand that, um, that it, just the question on your candidate sort of, you know, start on your website, do you have a disability, might not be a very friendly question. There are many different ways where you can say do you have a disability than saying it in that sentence. Uh, it, it, there are much more disability friendly sentences to put in and and we've got to learn that too and it might be that you're actually not getting to the universities or to the secondary schools or the apprenticeships we have apprenticeships at my company in engineering in manufacturing you've got to be able to think that are you you've got to have a, you've actually got to look at your monitoring you've got to look at your stats are you attracting the people because if you're not getting them in you ought to do something about it and I think that's it is we're probably not doing enough was the answer to your question <laughs> Oh, yes, Colin, let me give it to you. For anybody that works at any organisation, what I'd really like to see is some revolutionary thinking, some real radical thinking. And people that are um, associated with HR departments throughout the organisations like Joe here, you know, why can't, why don't organisations be, why aren't organisations bold enough to positively discriminate in favour of disabled people? Yeah, because we are allowed to take some positive action um, uh, and, and target, you know, particularly for disability, uh, to assist people to be candidates. You're right. Um, as for my employer, Amy, um, they are actually helping me to go into schools and into colleges and into universities as a disabled person to talk to them to try and get them into engineering or into work in general. So my employer is very, very keen on this. I would kind of, you know, big company, you know, lots, lots of um, recruitment going on within the organisation. I would probably say we're quite aligned um, from an air products perspective. Are we doing enough? Probably not at the moment. But we, you know, we, we do have a diverse and inclusive policy and strategy um, and really as, as me sitting on, on the leadership team that, that's partly my role having being a, a, you know, somebody with a, 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 a recognized disability actually trying to make that that change um, we're, we're focusing a lot as well on, on engineering and getting more women involved in engineering so you know we're, we're halfway there just let's do that and then we'll we'll, we'll deal with uh, with the disability questions yeah we're, we're just over time, but we have one more question I thought I saw over here. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that, that was related to what uh, she said about quotas. I come from Italy. In Italy, we do have 
for low quotas for disabled people into companies. And I can see it does work quite well because um, I have seen the difference. 20 years ago, you couldn't see anyone with disability working around workplaces. Now you do, you can see them, a lot of them. And there are very precise quotas. I don't think it, it does happen here, right? Okay, what do you think about that? What do you think about quotas? <laughs> I think it's quite a, quite, a contentious, quite a contentious topic. However, when we, if we look at the statistics of disabled people in employment, um, you, I think the percentages, um, and speaking from my own personal opinion, uh, experience, um, blind and visually impaired people um, the statistics of blind and visually impaired people of working age in work is only 25%. Whereas physically disabled people, um, the statistics are in the region of 48%. Now, quotas for some hard to place disabled employment sectors, I think, um, may be the only way forward. There are certain, you know, people with a learning disability, we're talking five to seven percent of those people of working age are in work. And with the ever increasing effort by the Department of Work and Pensions to get disabled people off benefit and into work, what encouragement is there for employers to actually to actually get the hard to place disabled groups into work it's it's quotas could well be one way but i i'm not absolutely sure it's going to be the ideal way i mean you say you're from italy and obviously there are there um they're pro uh, the protected employment sectors that you have, aren't they? Because they have them also in Spain. And in Spain, you find that the lotto is run and administered, probably not managed, but run and administered by blind and partially sighted people because that's, that's a protected sector. I I don't know I don't know whether it work in the UK. I'd be interested to know what other people's views are. I'm glad we don't have quotas in the UK. I do know they have them in other countries. I do know that um, some organisations um, um, take the fine instead of putting in the disabled. You kind of think that it's, it might be a token gesture or it might be the wrong kind of employees or it might be, or what, how disabled is, is the disabled employee for the quota? I don't know because it's such a spectrum, isn't it? Um, I'm, I think that it means that we have to think totally about the job and the abilities and the talent. And there is that talent amongst disabled people and we should just be able to recruit them without thinking about whether they're disabled or not. At the same time, though, I do believe in a little bit of targeting and a little bit of assistance during the process would be, you know, creates the level playing field quite a good degree. But I, I understand that some companies uh, in, in, in France, I know they also have quotas, uh, will take the hit instead and pay the fine um, because it's just, it's just not worth it or they don't believe in being able to just recruit disabled people for the sake of it and it's kind of looking at it the wrong way around and um, so it's interesting I didn't know actually that it was Italy as well but that's that's my views we should we should do it without having to to because it's it's good talent <laughs> I'd agree um, I think quotas they have a place uh, I know we we do track, you know, we, we look at you know disability and all the different you know um, boxes that that we need to tick within a HR perspective. However, I think we need to focus on the people, 
and the skills that the people bring, regardless of their uh, ability or disability. Um, so, yeah, I, I would agree. I think it's more about um, looking at the person and not looking at the disability. I, I could have quite easily been written off in 2008, um, and I wasn't. So they actually looked at the ability and, and, and what I could bring to the organisation, not the things that I couldn't do. Um, so, yeah. Thank you for mentioning, Colin, and you're so good on your stats, just off the top of your head, um, that learning dis disabled people have um, a 5 or 7 percent, approximately 6 percent chance of employment. Um, if you join, if your organisation joins in on these supported internship schemes, and there's a few of them out there, they collaborate with colleges and uh, and and you learn a sort of employability city and guild skill as well as coming to the company every day to learn some hands-on real sort of practical activities. Um, we're in our sixth year of support internships programs having 12 young people between 17 and 25 a year and we have to date got 60% of them year on year into employment. 60% instead of 6%. When you gave that statistic, you reminded me, I must say that. And I think that is a way forward for companies to A, change the culture in the organization, flood it with some people with disabilities, get people used to it, but also have some good news stories. Um, and, and also to show people that, it's, you know, they do do the jobs just as well as everybody else. There is loyalty. Stop being frightened of people with disabilities. Stop worrying that you're going to get the language wrong. You know, have the courage. Be bold. Employ people. You will like it. They will be good. Don't worry about it. And, and in fact, from our support internships program, we see people with learning disabilities getting into employment because of the intensive academic year they've spent with us learning stuff on a one-to-one -one basis with real uh, workplace mentors. What, what, what a way to end. That's perfect. Thank you. <laughs> um, we've run over. Um, so I think I'll just bring this to a close now. Um, thank you to the panelists who, who gave us some great insight and some gave, gave some great answers there. Um, we have more questions, so we may have to arrange another one of these. Um, but yeah, I would just like to, again, thank you all for coming uh, and thank you all for listening. So there's some more food at the back. Um, ah, Chloe just reminded me. Uh, we have feedback forms, so uh, if you liked it, if you disliked it, you want to ask some more questions or anything, please fill in the feed feedback forms. We read them all. We will be making adjustments accordingly and things like that. So, um, yeah, let us know what you think, and thanks for coming. Cheers. <laughs>